Welcome to Life Is, a podcast from the award-winning Bethel University Clarion. I'm co-host Zach Walker. And I'm co-host Abby Pouts. Today, life is changing. We'll talk about koala care changing stations, pronouncing last names wrong, and crying over a new car. We'll discuss Joe Exotic, Rex from Toy Story, and why change doesn't always have a silver lining. And even though we're supposed to talk about changing, we'll probably transition into other things and maybe talk to some folks over at the award-winning Clarion Newsroom. <laughs> because life is changing, but life is everything else, too. Life, life is <laughs> drops now. Okay, Abby. So life is changing. Um, so you know those changing tables in like gas station bathrooms or like any stalls for babies? Okay, yeah. They have koalas on them, right? Because <laughs> it's like koala care. Yeah. Why? Why is it koalas? Why is that the one they chose? And and what should it be? Because one, koalas, they're not a good animal. They're like cute and that's all they have for them. But they're like, they sleep all day. They also like always have sexually transmitted diseases. Like koalas oh, have, have those all the time. Look it up. And they're, they're bad. Koalas are bad. Koalas are people. very cute. I Please. think maybe because they like have a little body like a baby like you can put a koala on here you can put your baby on here <laughs> so, <laughs> that's if they true a giraffe like that would not make any sense you know because because you wouldn't be able to place a baby giraffe on, on there well maybe you couldn't i feel like i <laughs> i feel like i could probably place a baby giraffe on there. What animal do you think it should change to? Or are you a coward and want to keep it a koala? I'm fine with koala. Koala care has a nice little slogan. It's very cute. Um, my question is, why are you going into the biggest stall of the bathroom? Because those are for people with wheelchairs. So why are you taking those over? Well, I don't, you know, I feel like... Because you don't even really see them ever. I feel... I feel like the handicap stalls in bathrooms are used by people in wheelchairs like once a year. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that's incredibly offensive, but <laughs> you also, but then you also see those memes online where it is like, oh no, it happened. And then like, like a, a, a wheelchair will be outside the stall while a person is using it. So that's, that's a big fear of mine. Um, but I think yeah, people should rolls in and you're just in there. Yeah, oh, that would be the worst. Would like, be worst. I think that's that's low chances. I feel like yeah. the world could get hit by a big meteor before I'm in the handicap stall and a wheelchair rolls up. You know. <laughs> um, how are you doing with change? How am I doing with change? All right, yeah, very different from the very different from the koala question. I'm sorry. I've mostly been focusing on uh, on the on my koala thoughts during yeah. this break. How am I doing with change? I'm doing all right. Um, I I'm very grateful that I'm I'm at home and it's safe and I'm healthy and my family is healthy and I can still study and I can still write for the Clarion. Um, so that's pretty awesome. But yeah, it's a it was it's a pretty jarring change. Um, I've, we kind of like do I like change? I mean, yeah. I don't want it like every day all the time, but I also don't want it to be like um, never changing. I think as a, as a journalist, I like changing my work. I like doing different things, learning different stories um, every day. But this change isn't one that I would have like made happen or I would have said mm -hmm. a year ago, like, hey, I hope there's a pandemic and we all have to stay in our houses forever. Um, like I, I wouldn't want that, but... I'm uh, I'm working I'm working through it, trying to figure out my schedule, trying to figure out um, when I should be taking breaks, when I should be working on a lot of stuff, when I should walk outside on the road with my mom, all of that. But um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. How How about yourself? What's What's been a What's been a tough part of the change for you, or what's been a What's been an unexpected part of the change? I think that's a more interesting question. 
Because everybody can say, I didn't know that we we're going to go online. What's been unexpected? Yeah. I think that um, what was unexpected was like the smooth transition into online. I didn't really think it would go that well. Like I thought last week was kind of going to be like up in the air, like don't know what we're doing quite yet, but as we go, we'll figure it out. But I think all my professors have done a really good job of helping us with the transition. And it's really nice. All my professors um, emailed the whole class and said that they're more than happy to like take um, your opinions on things you might want to help like enhance the course or benefit the course and I thought that was really nice because I think some people are really set in their ways with certain things but they don't always make the most sense so I'm glad that all my professors are really willing to help all their students um so yeah I think that otherwise the change was kind of like what I expected just go home I'm a little more distracted I always want to go on a walk or like go outside just because being cooped up isn't my favorite thing. So I, mm -hmm. my dog, well, I have two dogs, but one doesn't like to walk. So I've taken one of my dogs on like three walks a day because they just get outside and hang out. She loves going on walks. So why does your dog not like to walk? Is well, it just she lazy? No, she's 10 and she has arthritis. Oh, so she okay. like drags a little bit. Oh, she, okay. Yeah. She likes walking at our cabin because her friend, <laughs> I'm not getting it's her best <laughs> friend. friend. <laughs> she lives like five houses up the hill and she literally like runs. We've never seen her do this. Like she's always just been a little walker because she has short legs. So she's slower. She just darts up there because she wants to see her best friend and her owners because they're so nice to her. So, so your your dog's friend is another dog, correct? It's not like an old woman who lives alone on the lake. Yes, and like it's waits dog. for your dog. Okay, no, it's another dog. Yep, dog they're friendship. <laughs> Nothing better than dog friendship, in my opinion. Uh, no. What what change would you like to see? in the next few weeks, either at Bethel, in the world, to the koala care baby industry, whatever. In the world, I think it would be really great to get back to like normal life, but I just don't see that happening. I think this situation is going to be a, a little bit of a long lasting thing. And it already has been longer than I think a lot of people expected. I think that it started as this big joke like coronavirus. And now that it's here, it's like, shoot, like we can't do anything. The world isn't going on. Like I work for a super small workout place in Maple Grove and we haven't worked in like a month. And I just feel bad for like, the owner because she's just super nice and it's just this small little community we have so I miss the community there I miss Bethel's community but I know that like Bethel will pull through whereas like these smaller businesses I just feel so bad for because I think that's where a lot of people get their income from when they start those businesses and they're really passionate about it so for those people I just hope they're praying and trying to get through everything because I'm sure their situation's really tough right now. But I don't know what is going to change in the next few weeks, which is kind of scary. But like, do we ever know what's going to happen? No. So what do you yeah. think? What do you want to see change? Um, I mean, yeah, I think if there's any like change to the like virus situation in the next couple of weeks, it's probably going to get worse. Um, yes. just, just looking at the, the math of it, like it's probably gonna mm -hmm. get worse for, for a while, but, um, I don't know. I think it's encouraging to see the positivity that people are trying to bring out right now, like with the, the chalk on the, on the sidewalks and people, um, putting like signs up on the windows and John Krasinski has this thing yes. called some good news. Like that's pretty cool, um, yes. on YouTube. Awesome. So I'll, all of that is is pretty exciting. Um, 
I mean, I think it would be pretty paramount if we could get um, a large portion of the country to understand that this is real and this is legit and we can uh, stop people from thinking like, oh, I can just do whatever I want. And I, this is, this is just like, like bigger flu. Um, like that's, it's, that's not. And I, I wish that would change. I would also wish I've seen, um, my mom like keeps talking about like things that she sees on, on Facebook. And, um, there are people posting about like, kind of like trashing like people who had to apply for unemployment and it's just like very politically driven and like uh, like they're saying like how can how can these people get like more money on unemployment when us who are working don't get anything and i don't know i just i don't think we need any of that we don't need any political disputes during this really hard time so my brother um applied for unemployment and is getting like four hundred dollars a week and he has like you can't you can't live off that so nobody's getting a lot right now everybody's right now and that's really disappointing to see like Mm -hmm. there i've also my mom talks about posts on facebook i think that's just a mom thing it really is the updates you like hey look at this like did you see what Look at, what, from- look at what Marsha posted. Yeah, like, it's just silly. But, like, my neighbors are, like, in their 80s, and their um, grandkids came over because they can't see them and just put little cute signs all over their door, and it's mm. just, like, the cutest thing to see. So I wish people would be more positive about everything going on instead of doing that because that doesn't make any sense because there's enough negativity going on right now. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff gives you hope with the grandkids and the grandkids. Yeah. Yeah, we can get through it. All righty. Next up, uh, we have Bethel political science professor, Dr. Chris Moore. Chris, thanks for coming on the show. Sure. It was, I felt like I had someplace I needed to go. It was great. Exactly. Um, tell us about your fun background with all of the stuffed animals. Are those all yours, I assume? Yes, I have an enormous stuffed animal collection. No, what I have <laughs> is two kids. I've got a seven-year-old and a five-year-old. And when I told them I was going to be using um, our guest bedroom as the, sort of our base of operations for um, Google Hangouts with students and doing online class prep and those sorts of things, they decided I needed a more fun background. So I've got a little pile of stuffed animals here on the bed behind me. And uh, Tommy added Rex from Toy Story, oh, yeah. uh, which I actually think is really appropriate because I don't know if like he, he talks, this dinosaur talks, but he says things that are like, really appropriate for academics. He says things like, great, now I have guilt. Um, <laughs> and, he, and he says, I, I was trying to come across as fierce, but I think it's just annoying. And that really speaks to me at a deep level. That, like the actual toy speaks? Yes. Do you want to hear it? Yes, I do. I can't guarantee what it's going to say. I am the dominant predator. <laughs> that is awesome. So that's He'd have to be my favorite character. Rex well, is your favorite character okay. from Toy Story? He's the funniest. He's definitely the most neurotic, right? Yeah. 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 I think he's funny. He's pretty good. Do the other do the other stuffed animals have names? Um, a couple of them do. The purple uh, elephant that you can see over my shoulder is Lavender. Ooh. Oh. Named by my that's daughter, a, not me. That's, that's, a, a, good that's one. a very nice name. Yeah. Um, so, right. Chris, other than playing with the Rex toy, um, <laughs> yeah. what, <laughs> what does a day look like for you now that you're quarantined at home? Well, okay. So, um, my wife and I are both teachers. My wife teaches third grade, and my daughter's in first grade. Tommy's kind of off the hook. Tommy was in his last uh, couple months at the CDC at Bethel, and that just ended abruptly like everything else did. So he's just our sort of free radical sowing chaos where he goes. Uh, But the rest of us are all trying to do online school of some kind. Uh, So my daughter right now I'm talking to you is doing a math lesson online, and my wife is planning online lessons and communicating with her third grade students. 
So what we're really fighting over, frankly, is bandwidth. Uh, so we have a trend <laughs> race board downstairs where we basically say who gets to be in video chats at any given time during the day. Uh, because if all three of us jump out at the same time, um, it crashes our Wi-Fi. So you, you actually, you have to schedule with your family. on Oh, the we're, we're, we're booked, <laughs> man. I'm glad I got you guys in. Oh, that's hilarious. So can can two people, like can you and your wife both be on a video chat? Yeah, we, we figured out two at the same time is cool. Uh, three is uh, is no bueno. Okay. <laughs> um, what's, uh, what's a highlight of any given day for you? I know there's a lot of chaos, but what? Sure. Getting you through it. I've actually, uh, I, I can, I don't think I'd ever want to transition to being an online only teacher. I love the interaction face to face with students in the classroom way too much, mm -hmm. but uh, I have like just a little bit of the flexibility. I live about a 25 minute drive from Bethel's campus. So when I go to Bethel's campus, I'm basically there for the day. And then I go home in the evenings and hang out with my family. But here I get those like punctuated moments of time. Uh, throughout the day where I can sort of check into my daughter, hang out with my son. Uh, he and I built a, a marble relay, kind of marble race kind of thing yesterday and just kind of did that in the middle of the day and then went back to some other stuff we were doing. So I wouldn't get that normally. And that's been kind of sweet. I think yeah. that people um, have loved that. The commute to Bethel or just driving to work has been something people have noticed like they are not missing at all and they're loving having the small interactions at home and not needing to drive anywhere or like you have more time. So I think there that's is a positive a, thing we can see from this change is no driving. Yeah, there is a downside to it though, right? Because yeah, on sure. the other hand, I when I'm at Bethel, I'm all I'm all work. And then when I go home, I say, okay, from now until the kids go to bed. I'm just focused on that. Now I just kind of feel like there's always this nagging thing hanging over my head of, I should be sending that next email, in that next post on Moodle. I should be doing that next yeah. thing. And I never quite get rid of that. I haven't figured out how to make that sort of on off switch. Mm -hmm. yet. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there's, I've had trouble over the the first week, like I've had all these things to do and I found myself just with a, with a chunk of time and then I'm just like, okay, I guess I'll work an hour on this piece of homework and then like do this thing for the clarion and do this thing. And I feel like I'm working way longer days than what I usually work mm -hmm. at school. And I don't have choir. I don't have like clarion meetings all the time. Um, but I like this week I've, I'm trying to block out like every hour of my day, which I usually don't do. Cause I feel like it's unhealthy to block out like lunch and breaks and like things that you should just figure out. But that's what I'm trying to do. Um, Chris, how you sound, like you... So, you sound like somebody who turns for the ask office is what you sound like. <laughs> yeah. Big yeah. thumbs up for the producer. Yeah, exactly. Um, as a professor, how have you had to change the way you teach? And have you ever had to do online instruction before? Only a couple of really brief stints. So I really wouldn't call it online instruction. So uh, both times that my, uh, my, when I, my kids were born, I scheduled out a couple weeks worth of online things just so that I could really stay home with my wife and um, for those first couple weeks before I went back to the classroom. But no, this is the first extended period of time of online education. And I've got some, some weird wrinkles this semester. Two of the classes I'm teaching, I've taught before. So it was mostly thinking about what do I do in those classes and how do I translate it to online? But the other class is a brand new class. And to make it even more crazy, I'm co-teaching it with Chris Garrett from the history department. So we have 70 students in this class called the History and Politics of Sports. And it's a sports class. We had a whole bunch of really pretty interactive things planned, including field trips and simulations. And all that stuff had to get massively reworked uh, once uh, we knew we were going online only. So it's been a really pretty big change. Hmm. So what, what were the... Um the main changes for that class in a class of 70 that you had all those simulations. What are you doing now? Well, the big bummer is that we had a planned field trip to a uh, target field to see how the uh, stadium integrates with the community around it, uh, how it works at a political level, how it works at a logistic level. We had some Bethel alums who work for the twins who were going to kind of meet with us and talk to us about their professions. We just basically had to can it. Um, there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's no way to do that. Um, in a virtual environment. 
uh, unless we got like a drone or something and flew it around Target Field or something like that. <laughs> um, but uh, other things we're trying to translate more. So, for example, as students this morning are starting a simulation, but they're doing it online. We have a couple different. We have the class broken up into teams of seven, so it's ten teams. They're playing different roles in a public financing debate, determining whether or not cities are going to pay money to. Um, Pay, help pay for a new NFL stadium in a fictional city. And there's different roles, different players who are competing about whether or not the city should shell out that kind of money or not. Mm. Um, so last thing here, um, what do you think, what change do you think needs to happen either at, in the world, in the country, at Bethel, whatever level you want to, you want to go? Um, what change do you think needs to happen the most? Well, as much as I, really don't like that we had to do this we did at bethel we did have to do this i'm grieving uh, and i don't use that term lightly uh, for the fact that there won't be a commencement this year or at least there won't be an in-person commencement this mm. year for all kinds of reasons for our seniors uh for retiring faculty for jay barnes who's retiring i know this is like one of his favorite things is commencement so i just feel bad for him at a personal level but we had to do it there's um i can't imagine going back uh any time before commencement and having it be safe. So that's appropriate. And honestly, what's been interesting, and um, I'm talking with a couple of my colleagues about this, but the different state responses, you know, 50 states in the United States, every state's governor and its legislature have a lot of control over public health in those states, oftentimes even more control than the federal government. And um, they're, uh, um, uh, this, the, the, there's a, been a huge variance in what states have done. Some states have been very proactive. Minnesota has been kind of in the upper 25% in terms of how proactive it's been. Um, and some states have really lagged behind. And this is going to be, sadly, kind of a natural experiment. We're going to see what those different policy choices do to the infection rates and, sadly, the death rates in those different city, states. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for the insight, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so last thing, could you you you're a podcaster yourself? So can uh, you can I'm you part of the Sam Thirty Nine Hundred Network? Yes. Okay. So <laughs> so what just happened was our producer uh, sent me a chat that said have him plug his podcast. So I guess that was Sam just wanting his own <laughs> podcast plug. Now he's showing his shirt with Channel Thirty Nine Hundred to the camera. Um, so Chris, what kind of podcasts uh, are so can, can people listen to you on? Sure. If you just search um, on line for channel 3900 it's on podbean um i'm one of the hosts of a podcast called election shock therapy we've been doing it since 2016 and uh we'll be running through um uh through this election and talking about polling data talking about election returns and all kinds of things leading up to uh, november 2016 uh, 2020 um and i'm also with chris garrett's for that sports class we do a sports and academics podcast uh called the 252 mm. How long have you been podcasting for Bethel? Oh, um, not quite as long as, as, as Garrett's and Mulberry and those guys, but probably at least five or six years. Five or six years. And how long have you been a prophet, Bethel? Uh, this is uh, year 12 for me. Year 12. Can't, can't believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so being a, being a prophet that's worked for, for over, over a decade, for 12 years, what kind of like long-term ramifications do you think the virus will have on Bethel? Ooh, that's a good question. I actually think this is, and I'm, I'm, this is a, th this comes not from any kind of um, academic evidence or any kind of scholarly evidence, but it's um, something that I comes from my sense of periodicity. Um, the the longer the effects of coronavirus go on, the more likely those effects are to be long term. If basically by the middle of the summer everything is quote unquote back to mostly normal. I don't mean the economy. We're headed for a pretty deep recession and that could last a year or more. But if basically people are kind of going out of their houses, they're getting back to their day normal lives, schools reconvene in August, I think the long-term effects on Bethel will be relatively small um, because we'll basically hit a new school year and say, well, that was a weird spring, but we're back to normal now. But if we have to start the school year with some kind of online education with sort of hopes of like, well, maybe we'll be in the classroom by November or something like that. I think the ramifications will be enormous and mostly detrimental. Mm. So what, 
what do you think one of those detrimental ramifications can be? Oh, I mean, to be to be dire, if you're thinking about the incoming freshman class who has not a lot of deep emotional investment with Bethel, why would they come and start online school at a school that charges Bethel's tuition prices? Why wouldn't they just take community college classes for a year, a semester or a year and wait and see mm-hmm. how things pan out? I mean, I, and I don't think it's just Bethel. I think if uh, schools can't reconvene in August, we'll see a cratering of college enrollment. And I mm. think that, that's, that's really scary. Yeah, it is scary. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, thanks for coming on, Chris. We really appreciate oh, all you, you had to say. What's that? And, uh, Abby said something. I think she probably said thank you. Yes. Thank she you. made for this Sorry. wonderfully awkward exit. <laughs> uh, but... Thank you for coming on and thank you for uh, sharing sharing with us Rex and all the other stuffed animals. You're absolutely welcome. Thanks for the podcast, folks. All right. Here's my favorite segment that we've started. This needs to stop or this needs to start. We talk about something that there's too much of in the world or there's not enough of in the world. So I'll be talking about everybody's favorite documentary miniseries, Netflix special, Tiger King, with your boy Joe Exotic. Uh, <laughs> I watched I watched the first three episodes of Tiger King uh, a couple days ago. I stayed up till like 2 a.m. Um, and I was hooked. It's a great, great show. And then my mom and I watched the rest of them. So we watched four of them in a row last night. Um, because Abby, you texted me yesterday and said, we should talk about Tiger King on the podcast. Um, and I said, and I thought, well, I got to watch all of it because I don't want Abby spoiling anything for me. Okay. Okay. So I watched all of Tiger King. Say that again. It's like really fresh in your mind. I watched, I was done with it like a week ago. Okay. Did you, did you marathon it or did you watch it like over a week? No, I marathoned it. I did in one sitting. I, no, oh no, I can't do that. I get like a headache. My uh, mom and I watched one episode. She wasn't hooked like I was. I think she was just like, "This is too crazy to even be watching," and so I watched it over like three days. But once okay. I got to the last episode, I felt like sad. I was like, "Really? Like this was really enjoyable to watch. <laughs> like it was just something to yeah. take away." With. Um, everything going on so it was so yeah. fun so yeah. do you think that oh she well first her- first oh, first okay. thing i want to give a spoiler warning to anyone listening to this podcast who oh, hasn't yes. seen tiger king because no. so if you if you have not seen it skip this segment and go to the next one but okay abby ask ask your question do you think that um she killed her husband Carol? Yeah, Carol Baskin. Hey there, all you cool cats and kittens. It's Carol Baskin from Big Cat Rescue. Um, Yeah, absolutely. She totally killed her husband. Carol is is cold. Carol is calculated. Carol is high off of greed and high off of people thinking that she's a saint and that she's saving cats, which given... She's doing a better job than Joe. Not as good of a job as Doc with like how they care for the cats. Although Doc like kills his cats, I think. So that's yeah. like pretty bad. And Doc is the worst person ever. Um, but Carol yeah. do- Carol doesn't breed cats. So like that is her one merit. Um, yeah. But oh yeah, Carol, absolutely. She either killed her husband. She either like, like has him locked up in some underground cage or something crazy because I think the tell was when sh- they f- they have the footage or they have they figured out that she broke into the office and then rewrote mm-hmm. his will and said upon my disappearance. Yes, and it's like it's not odd. Like it how is odd. When investigating that are you not like this is not a good sign, right? I think if they're reopening up the case, I read really? that. Yeah, I read that somewhere. And that I also heard that her husband before that had a restraining order against her. I bet. So I, mean, she- I don't understand why 
that's a thing. Also, hearing from his kids was really like this show, although it's super crazy and just insane, it was really sad in some aspects. Me for the animals wise, I just is terrible to see. But mm. even like his kids talk about um Carol and him being afraid of Carol was really sad. Yeah. No, it's um I mean it's a crazy show. And like I've heard yeah. people say that like, oh, it just seems like a like a reality show or no. they don't like it because it's too crazy. But like I think it is brilliantly reported. Yes. I think it like the the team spent so long reporting this and followed mm -hmm. like all these crazy rabbit trails really well. And the way yeah. that the documentary is made is so interesting and so perfectly honest about all the characters. One of my yes. favorite edits in the whole thing um, is with Doc Antel, my least favorite man on the entire planet. Um, he's the worst. Um, Doc, well, I love that they show Doc like trying to direct the documentary and yeah. saying like, hey, you should come up uh, to my door and then I'll say, hey, how's it yeah. going? And then they show that and then they show him like acting. But my favorite, <laughs> my favorite edit in the whole show is when um, the reality TV producer, the guy that kind of talks like this and he, he yep. sits and smokes and he goes, yep. there's, there's something, there's really something, uh, something crazy that gives, uh, when you hold these big cats, it's just a feeling of power that you get. And then they cut <laughs> immediately to Doc riding an elephant through his neighborhood. And it's just, it's prime. It's so perfect. It really exposes everyone, but um tiger king is is a gift to humanity it's great but uh quickly what i think needs to start for the segment is not tiger king 2 it's not a new series it's not <laughs> tiger king one more episode i read that so another one one more episode oh that's pretty interesting yes. so okay. that's cool Three? i don't need more tv shows i don't need a tiger king movie i've heard a lot of people call for that yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, it'd be cool. I'd go see it. It, it, it would star yeah. Michael Keaton, hopefully, because yeah. it looks just like Joe Exotic. Shout out to yeah. my boy Mark Ives for pointing that out to me. Um, but what I want to see is Tiger King the musical. <laughs> I, I want to see Joe Exotic and Doc Antel and that like fat strip club owner at the end. <laughs> on the on the Broadway stage with huge tiger animatronics. You got the lights. You got Joe singing a ballad about his sob story past. You got he Doc. Is a singer, so oh yeah, of course happen. he is. Yeah, it's not lip synced at all. He's he's the best singer. You yes. got Doc is like get getting the getting the villain song. Tiger <laughs> King, the music the musical is what we need. That is what needs to start. We don't need the movie. Because imagine, that'd be the best musical ever. Everybody would, would go see it. If, But I think not with the actual people, with like some actual talented people. <laughs> I think that would actually be an interesting storyline. It's insane. Like, it's a my roommate story. texted and they were like, who's watched Tiger King? And I was like, I have blah 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 and they were like is it good and I'm like I don't know if it's like good scary or really bad but like it's just insane you don't expect any of it like from what I saw on the little preview on Netflix to the whole series I was like this was insane I did not expect any of this but I could not stop watching yeah it's uh it's amazing also so when I was talking about the musical Tiger King and the musical I was thinking like yeah. broad actors playing everybody oh, okay. but then you said that it should be the regular people. And <laughs> I agree now. I think it should be Joe Exotic. I think it should be Doc. I think Get it should him be that, that guy that like, has, a, has a monkey son that is always the guy like... Who got brand new teeth. Yeah, <laughs> the guy who got brand new teeth and yeah. now he's got new ones. Yeah, you, yep. got, you get all those guys on a Broadway stage. You give them money. They'll do anything for money. Yep. We've seen that. Yes, um, we you, have. You get Carol, you give her money, and then you like tell her that she's a good person, and then she's on. Oh my goodness. Um, hilarious. You know who I think is 
probably the person with the most merit in the show because everybody's pretty horrible. And the yeah. person that I just like kind of feel bad for is Howard Baskin. Yeah. Carol's husband. That guy, I, I mean like I don't know. Like he seems like he's really on Carol's side. And I feel like if you're on Carol's side, you have to be a little crazy. But is he crazy or is he like was he taken advantage of and brainwashed by this yeah. manipulative witch woman, Carol? Yeah. Because, like, you can tell Howard Baskin was, like, not a cool kid in high school. <laughs> and, like, and I, I feel like he, he found Carol and he, like, liked cats as well. And he's like, oh, my gosh, like, <laughs> it, it's, I have a wife now. And then I feel like Carol manipulated the heck out of that guy. Yeah. So I my, my heart goes out to Howard. The only normal or like semi normal people in the show is the man that um is an amputee. He mm -hmm. fell off the zip lining thing, which is like ironic. Yeah. Um he is normal and also the woman who got her arm bit off by the tiger. I think she is pretty normal too. I think they're all just like, they all need to make money and they know, those two know like, oh, these probably aren't the best people, but this is what I have to do right now. I thought those two were the most normal. They also weren't shown a lot, which I think is a great job by the people who produced the film because showing Joe Exotic is just pure gold. He's just yeah. insane. Yeah. The clips from his YouTube videos are like, it's just great. It was a great show. It was a great show. So everybody, go watch Tiger King. Um, go talk about Tiger King. And um, donate to my Kickstarter for Tiger <laughs> King the Musical. All right, so next we have lifestyle reporter from the award-winning Clarion, Emma Eidsvog, not Voog, even though we've all known it as Voog. <laughs> I have known it as Voog since five minutes ago. Um, no, Vogue. See, I just oh. messed it up. Yeah. Um, Emma, Emma, when she joined the video chat, said, hey, my last name is Eidsvog. Um, and it, it was the first time that I had that I had heard that, or at least heard it, so I remembered it. So Emma, has there been points where I've said it blatantly wrong to your face, and you just haven't corrected me? I'm sure there has been, probably in Clarion meetings, or okay. I know we did like a a podcast for one of our classes, and you said it wrong on the podcast for sure. So. <laughs> oh, perfect! That's yeah, awesome. So yep. Um, it's is it just be awkward saying like? this is actually how you say it because I didn't tell my roommates what my last name was or how to pronounce it for like the first three months of living <laughs> with them. They called me yeah. Pots the whole time and it's house, And I just was like, whatever. And they <laughs> called you Abby Potts. Yes. Well, that just so sounds like a, months. that just sounds like a literacy problem <laughs> with them. I mean, Potts. <laughs> Yeah, that's sure. I've heard that before, but I just don't even connect. So I was just like, whatever, like it's fine. Yeah. Oh, you're over it. Yeah. I've heard it Eidsvoog all my life. Like yeah. swim meets, they announce your name, Eidsvoog. I think um they said it wrong at graduation too. They said Eidsvoog. So oh, really? I don't really doesn't really offend me anymore. I just thought I'd clear that up once and yep. for all. You're just, yeah, you're just used to it. Thank you, charge. Okay, Emma, so what has been the most jarring thing about change over the past few weeks? I know you have a mm -hmm. lot of siblings, so yeah. talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, I moved home, I think, a week ago, two weeks ago now, so... Um, I have six, I think it's six younger siblings at home right now, and uh, five of them are taking classes, or four of them. The youngest is three, so oh, wow. it's a busy household. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it's just been trying to get used to taking classes and um, focusing on that and not thinking about 
all the dishes that have to be done and everything else here that has to go on. So, um, and then, so that's that. been a change. The dishes are a big thing to think about. It's just yeah. worrisome. So are you the oldest then? Um, I am in, in a family of 12, so I'm the sixth oh. oldest. So the oldest, um, the older five are out of the house. So, oh, okay. yeah, so I'm the oldest in the house. So how old is your oldest sibling then? She just turned 30. Oh, wow. That's yeah. so crazy. Yeah. So how is it um, with getting your homework done or getting any clarion stuff done with like a three-year-old in the house? How have you been doing with that distraction? Because I have a niece who's four and I know it's a big distraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, that's a good word for it, distracting. Like, <laughs> I don't know, honestly, last week I barely did anything. I was like, all this, we have so much cleaning that needs to get done. And they're like trying to figure out how to do online classes too. So I'm kind of there helping them out. Mm -hmm. And um, my mom and dad are still kind of working. So kind of been in charge a lot. Um, and so this week I was like, okay, I need to plan out my week and like write everything I have to get done down. And so hopefully this week goes better than last week. But yeah, it's just a like week for everyone right now is, okay, this is how last week went. Let's plan this week out a little mm -hmm. better. because Life was changing last week so much and it was so crazy. Right. Now you can get used to it a little more. So how are you planning everything out? Mm -hmm. I'm just like, I just wrote a list last night of every assignment that I have this week. And then um, I have like an office that I work in in the basement. So it's a little quieter <laughs> yeah. and away from the craziness, but um, just trying to stay focused and not worry about things that I shouldn't be worrying about and realize that I'm still a college student and I'm not just at home, you know, for a break or anything like I have to get work done. So just kind of like, trying to stay motivated and focused. So, yeah. Did you, you say that, oh, sorry, Zach. Did you say that uh, both of your parents are still working? Yeah, so uh, my mom's been doing like a couple odd jobs. Um, she used to drive uh, a van for the school, so she's not doing that, but, um, and then my dad, he delivers coach buses like throughout the country. So I think he's been doing that less and less because people aren't going out but um uh so he's gone on a couple trips and he actually like goes to like new jersey and then flies back for uh, his job so um yeah i'm not sure how much he'll be doing that now so um yeah that's another thing to worry about is like they're worried about finances and everything and they want to work but obviously it's everything's shutting down so <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So have you with oh, with with both of your parents sometimes out of the house, have you had to take on like part of the parenting role with your younger mm -hmm. siblings? Yeah, some days, yep, I have to do that. Like um there's not much like I don't have to facilitate everything, but make sure they're not fighting. They like to fight with each other and yell and all that. So it's just kind of like yeah, being that parent, making sure they're eating their food, cleaning up after themselves. Kind of been doing it like for a while now because we started foster care in 2011. So that's kind of been my role for a while now. So, um, but yeah, so there's that kind of tension of like wanting to be a parent and help out and like be there for them. But then I also have to like do my classes and do different things. So there's that tension there. Kind of yeah. like what uh, Chris Moore was talking about, that nagging feeling. Like I definitely feel that like all day, like wanting mm -hmm. to be with them and like, yeah. So just something to get used to, I guess. I'm sure everyone is feeling that right now, like stuff at home, family drama, stuff that like we could get away from being at Bethel, but now it's like we're in the center of it and <laughs> it's just going to take some getting used to, but yeah. Yeah. Um, how has, so now that you're, you're studying at home full-time, you're a full-time student, um, but you also have to take on that parenting role and you have that, that nagging feeling, how has um, the transition from Bethel to online affected 
the way you're able to interact with your siblings and the way you're able to take on that, that almost parent role. Mm-hmm. Um, I think last week I was like, honestly not thinking about classes. Like I was definitely taking that parenting role and now realizing that's not going to work. Like I can't be doing that as much. And so this week it's going to be more like me being away from them, which I think they'll miss me. They'll be like, why can't you come (laughs) play with us? Why can't you just hang out? And so kind of having to say no, like I have work to do and which is hard, but um, yeah, just kind of take some discipline to say no. (laughs) Yeah. But all right. Um, Anything that uh, we can, people can look out for on the Clarion website that's coming out of yours this week? Yeah, of course. Uh, I am working on a profile story on Kuge um, Nape, I think is how you say her last name. She led the Thailand mission trip last winter. And um, I'm just going to share her story. She has a, I had a really great time there and um, she's from Thailand originally. So um, just a really cool story of her returning home and everything and leading a mission trip. So that should be out on Wednesday, I believe. Um, so yeah. Awesome. People should look out for that. All right. Thanks for coming on, Emma. Yeah, of course. Thank Thank you, Emma. Take care. Okay, Zach. So life is changing. That's the theme. (laughs) What's, tell me about the hardest change you've made. Like, do you remember a change where you just had a breakdown like my sister when we were probably like I was six and she was four just had a mental breakdown because we got a different car <laughs> she really didn't enjoy that so and that yeah. was your that was your sister's hardest change in her whole life I don't think it was she just had a breakdown over it was just getting a different car about it and um, well <laughs> mine's not that but like like a hard change like in, in my life or in okay um i think i've i've probably talked about my transfer situation mm-hmm. when i transferred from uw so i won't go into like crazy detail but that was the hardest change that i've ever had to make um that was extremely tough I went to UW, I was majoring in mechanical engineering, realized I didn't want to do that, thought I have spent so many years, I started applying to schools when I was, I mean, as soon as I could, applied to like 12 schools, um, narrowed it down, narrowed it down, narrowed it down, spent a year, like a year doing scholarship stuff, finally ended up at UW, and I just didn't like it at all. The culture wasn't there for me, um, I wasn't excited in classes. And it, I didn't have things figured out and that was crazy to me. Um, and I had to, I had to make, I had to admit to myself that I had make, made a wrong decision. And I had to admit to myself that um, this wasn't, this wasn't right for me. And then I had to start over. Um, so that was the hardest part of the transition. I think it wasn't like, oh, I have to leave Madison, even though I miss a lot of people there. And I miss my, uh, my satire paper that I wrote on. Um, but it was more like I, I had to, to make this decision that I need to make this big change that is going to uproot my life. And I need to start over and I need to go to a different school where I know nobody. And I, I had to come into Bethel at the mid year and figure things out. Um, but it was extremely formative. It was the best decision I've ever made, but that change was, uh, was really hard. Um, and that was, it took me a while to, to actually make the decision to make that change. But looking back, it's been almost constant positives from that change. So was your first class at Bethel last January with Scott? No. no. Were you there the semester before? So I, uh, my first semester at Bethel was, um, spring 2018. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I came in, I went to Madison for one semester, came in, did spring 2018, took no journalism classes. 
yeah. didn't think I wanted to do it. it. It was one of, I had two majors and that was one of them, but I'm like, I don't want to just write all day. And then that, um, that's the next fall. I took Scott's reporting one class and my life was, and I changed my life and I loved journalism and I said, I want to do this. And then I took sports reporting, which is where we met. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I wrote a story on Elena Evans, which was like the big turning point in my journalism yes. world where I'm like, wow, I can, I can do this. And I really like doing this and I should keep doing this. And that's when I like really committed to it. Um, yeah. And that was all part of the change that I made from transferring. That's awesome. Oh so, yeah. Um, I think I have a, here's a question for you. Okay. The question is, do you think change is always formative? And I want to say something quick before, because I think every time humans talk about change, every, it, it, it always ends with like, Oh, it's always for the best. Like we can always find a silver lining. Mm -hmm. It's always, you can always grow from it. Change is constant, all of that. But do, do you think change is always positive? Do you think you always grow from it? Or do you think change exists where it's just unfortunate and it's yeah. just bad? Yeah. I think um, with change, you're always going to grow. I don't know how, like, but I don't want to say it's like, like you're forced to grow more. I um, went through like a period of time where my grandparents were killed in a car accident. My mom's oh my sister, so my aunt died from cancer and my brother and his wife had a stillborn within like six months. And I think that those changes and that kind of a change is like you can't get positive from that. Like there just isn't and you just question a lot. And like for sure I've grown as a person and I use those experiences to be a better person. But I think I would have still been where I am today without those experiences. Mm -hmm. So for that kind of a change, I don't think it's positive at all. What do you think? Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd love to just ask like during that time, were there, were there any like strategies that you used or things that like, even though the change sucked and even though the change, like I totally agree with you that a change like that, I, I don't know. It's almost, it, it doesn't feel right to say like, Oh, I'm a better person because of it. Yeah. Oh, I, I can deal with we. I can deal with grief better, even though there there might be some co subconscious positives. But like, yeah, for sure, that ju that just sucks. But like through that, how did you how did you deal with that idea that nothing will nothing good might come of this? This is going to be a negative. Like, how did you get through it and not just get sucked into the to the sadness and and wallow in that? I think it was trying to be um positive for my family and trying to be strong because like I think my mom was hurting the most I don't think she'd ever say that but I think she was and seeing that hurt me more so I wanted to just be strong for her um I really found like I don't like when people talk about this like when they find God because God's always there but mm -hmm. I really lean on God more and like understood like our relationship more because before I never wanted to participate in church or anything like that it was just something like I went to I never got a lot out of it compared to now where I get so much out of it and get so much out of learning about God so I don't want to be like cliche but I really like leaned on God during that time because there just wasn't anyone else. Like it's hard to lean on family because they're hurting just as much as you, if not more. So I think that's what helped me. If I can even say like helped, it just got me through it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, do you think your faith is stronger because yeah. of, 
what happened. Yeah, and I don't like to say that because, again, it's like those yeah. positive things shouldn't come from things that hurtful to you and your family. But I do think I just learned to trust God in a different way. But, like, I think for, like, no matter what, I'll always be upset that that happened. And it happened, like, in that way in such a short amount of time where, like, it was just like God was kicking us when we were down. Like, oh, here's another, here's another. It was just, like, you shouldn't have to attend that many funerals in that amount of time for people that are that close to you that you, like, plan the funeral. So I think my faith grew, but it grew because I wanted it to, because I didn't want to be so upset with God, because, like, I know, like, my grandparents wouldn't have wanted that for me. Like, they wouldn't have wanted me to be upset with God. They were very deep in their faith. And so just trying to make them proud as I grow is how I kind of view it, is have a relationship with God, like your grandparents did, and make them proud because you're, you have good morals, and you're living life as a Christian, and so I think it led me, like, those changes led me to where I am, but I still think, like, personally, I would be the same person, so change just sometimes sucks. You've been listening to Life Is, a podcast from The Clarion, Bethel University's national award-winning student publication. We'd like to thank our producer, Sam Mulberry, and the future director of Broadway's Tiger King the Musical for listening to what people want. The Clarion still publishes stories every day online at BethelClarion.com. If you haven't already, go and check out Emma Eidsvood's profile and Kuge Nape. Please tell the people in your life about Life Is, which drops Monday and Friday until we run out of things to say. Because ultimately, life is people. So tell all the cool cats and kittens. And tell the koala in the biggest bathroom stall. And tell Emma Ides Vogue's third youngest sibling. And tell Chris Moore's stuffed animal army.